here. And I'm uh, currently camping in the Pine Barrens. And here's one of the sacred lakes of the Lenape people. And um, some fun plants here. It's pretty amazing habitat. Water lilies are there, and those are flowering. <clears throat> There's also a hypericum here, like St. John's wort. Not sure the species. And there's also some water whorehound. I'm looking for it right now. I know I saw it yesterday. Here's some of it. And this is a, a plant that's been coming up. I found it at Cherry Valley Co-op a lot. And it likes these semi-aquatic areas. And it's in the mint family, so it has a square stem, opposite leaves, bilaterally symmetrical flowers. And uh, it's actually a mild sedative and astringent. So it's uh, a styptic, which means it helps coagulate bleeding. And it also um, seems to have this quality of um, the aromatic principle of mint. So it is aromatic. It smells pretty nice. Kind of smells thyme-like. And uh, it's a beautiful plant that grows around. You see it kind of similar to motherwort, but it has an aromatic property, but the seeds are similar how motherwort has that cluster on it. And so it's an aromatic plant, mint family. And then here's uh, a kind of myrtle, right? This is like a bay leaf substitute. And these are all over the coast, the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, and these have a aromatic and fragrant smell. There's wax myrtle, and then there's bayberry. I believe this is bayberry. It has a really beautiful aromatic smell, uh, similar to California Bay, something like that. Good morning, Brittany Claudia, welcome. And um, these leaves are really good. They're very aromatic. They have essential oils, so they're helpful for anything uh, fighting infection, right? The plant has uh, these chemicals inside of its body to help it fight infection within itself. So it'll do the same thing if we consume it. So a leaf or two in tea, as long as you're not breastfeeding or pregnant, would be very helpful. These uh, oils in this family the Maristacaceus family um, have these aromatic oils that can be abortifacient because they're very astringent plants. So you wouldn't necessarily want to consume them um, if you were pregnant. And then of course there's a lot of pines here. So those pine trees have uh, edible and drinkable needles with vitamin C and they make pollen in the summer and they give us firewood and they have the sap which is helpful for blood cleansing respiratory conditions things like that there's even a medicinal use of water lily but i can't remember what it is um, it's said to be an edible but anybody who's tried has been heavily disappointed so there's a lot of bracken fern on the trail and those are edible when they're furled. They look like an eagle claw. And so those are really nice. And then there's a lot of uh, Ilex glabra, I believe it is. And this is one of the Ilex species, like a holly. And this one has, oh, it's not glabra. I'm forgetting the species. And these all have tea drinking capacity. This is like mate, right? Mate in the Ilex genus. And then there's nothing but blueberries everywhere. So these are blueberry shrubs. There's a bunch of different species, including high bush and low bush. And um, the berries are all gone, but the leaves are still a really good uh, addition to tea. They also have vitamin C, things like that. Here's uh, someone leaving their water bottle at the campsite. Never the best thing. Yeah, so just wanted to show you all a bit. Oh, I'll show you one more plant, which is really fun. Here's Indian sarsaparilla, uh, not Indian, false sarsaparilla. Of course, in the Frank Cook tradition, they don't recommend 
using the word false. So this is in the Araliaceae or the ginseng family, and most of the leaves of the ginseng family also have um, those ginseng-like alkaloids, so you can just harvest a leaf or two of each plant. This is usually not a very abundant plant. Hey Matt, I'm in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. And so this is usually not a very abundant plant, so we wouldn't recommend harvesting it. But you can see here, there's probably 100 or 200 plants. So in the backyard of the campsite, there's a forest of false sarsaparilla. So these have edible and drinkable roots. And of course, all the Aureliaceae usually have, oh, look at that sandy soil. Yummy. It's pretty nice for pine barrens. So you can always do a soil test right by seeing how it clumps so there's not much clay, a lot of sand. And so those roots can be harvested from plant to plant and you can actually cut uh, basically the umbilical cord between them and then replant the uh, saplings with some of the root on it. And so there is a regenerative harvest there. And as I mentioned, the leaves are also helpful. So uh, the roots have this edible bark that's on the outside. People have said they've made noodles from them. I wouldn't exactly call them noodles. They taste like, uh, you know, root beer, sarsaparilla-like. And they're also an adaptogen, so they're very helpful for uh, immune system repair. So sarsaparilla, basically, is... Um, a term which was used for many species, and one of them, the most famous, is Jamaican sarsaparilla, and that's um, in the Smilax family. Smilax, oh, it will come to me. And so Jamaican sarsaparilla was harvested and used as a soda, and that's back when sodas were medicinal, and if they were fermented, they would actually be very medicinal still. And so Jamaican sarsaparilla got over-harvested, and then for some reason the industry switched to trying to provide this as an aromatic root for making things like root beer, essentially, or sarsaparilla drink. Um, so it's called false sarsaparilla, I guess, because it was the replacement, and people over-harvested it in the habitat that it grew in. Um, they harvested tons and tons of it. Of course, they learned that from the native people, and so they weren't caretaking in a respectful way at all. They just wanted to sell it to the global market, and so... That brings us to, you know, how do we regenerate and harvest this in a way that actually is sustainable. And there's some case to be made that if you thin out plants, if you thin out roots, it causes growth. So you can also get some uh, beneficial growth if you do it in certain ways. And that's a big conversation. How do we harvest and work with plants in a way that actually helps them regenerate? There are ways, but there are also easy ways to just exploit and rip this all out and make 30 bucks and uh, feel good about something um, but that's not really what we want to go for we want to go for how many are in each population uh, what does sustainable harvesting look like how do we tell the signs of um, sustainable harvest how do we come back and caretake a patch year after year how do we see what we've done uh, those are all a part of you know harvesting and working with plants so uh, with the ghost pipe you know i've been watching that space uh, all those plants for probably 15 years and so in this region, it's very abundant, but in other regions, I wouldn't harvest it from there. So um, there's always a way of working regeneratively. And that's, I think, something we've lost. And especially in our modern pharmacologically based herbal practice, often we're just going around uh, grabbing things because they're materials and then um, not necessarily thinking about the consequences of the harvest. So this is always a good topic and always a good point and always a good discussion. And if you're interested, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, I think is a really good uh, look into some of that. So this is acorn, sassafras, and pine habitat. And this was all the pine barrens. Anywhere that's called pine barrens used to be under the ocean. All right, so this is all really acidic soil. That's why pines love it. And uh, I'll just show you all one mushroom that I found this morning when I was collecting firewood for morning coffee. So here's uh, an edible Lactarius. There's three or four species of Lactarius in this region. 
that are edible, and they all have a brown cap. Awesome to heal, awesome to hear healingology. Braiding Sweetgrass is one of the most profound books uh, I've ever read. And so I actually listened on audiobook. And um, so thanks to Yuli for letting me borrow her uh, Audible's account. And I listened to Braiding Sweetgrass for like a two weeks straight on audio. So you can see there's what's called corrugation. That's where this uh, mushroom gets its name, Carugus, Lactarius Carugus. And so it has a brown cap. This one's kind of beat up, but still pretty good. And then they're, they really last, and they're really meaty mushrooms. Uh, so you can get a substantial amount just out of one. And if you damage the gills, and don't just explode them like I just did, you can get milk, right? And Lactarius all produce milk. And some of that milk is really spicy. And so you can actually take a little taste on your tongue and you make sure that it doesn't have a spicy flavor. And if it does, it's not an edible Lactarius. Yes, yeah, sourdough. I definitely love Robin Wall Kimmerer's work. Um, you know, I had heard of that book for years. And then uh, I went to the International Herb Symposium and she was the keynote speaker. And I didn't even know that it was the same author of the book. I'd never heard her name. And she just blew me away. Her speech, her, her lecture there was so inspiring and so amazing. And she wove indigenous medicine stories with modern science in such a profound way. And I think she should be the president of the United States. I think we should vote for Robin Wall Kimmerer. There's the first lady president. Um, so these three species, Carugus, Volemus, and Hygrophorides grow um, in a lot of the country. And this one happens to have the corrugated um, cap. And so that's where you get the name Carugus. So it milks right and that's one of the ways that you can tell any lactarius will produce a kind of milk right even in the stem if you see that it's beating up there and there are many spicy lactarius and people have always said oh well they're like habaneros and uh you can still eat them but anybody who has has gotten uh, a digestive upset from it so i just go after the brown cap um light guild colored lactarius and they're really super good, so I'll saute them up. I'll, you know, cook them in some butter for 15 minutes and then crack some eggs in them. And that'll be our breakfast for the morning at the old inn. We're hanging out at a cabin this weekend, me and the Return to Nature team. And uh, it's her birthday today, so wish Lauren a happy birthday in some way, shape, or form. Check out my new post, um, giving love and respect to Lauren. And I think we're going to play some music at some point today. Thanks for your reminders of all of the good in the world. Thanks for being examples in the ways that you can. Um, Sardella, yeah, campaign for Robin Wall Kimmerer for president. She definitely should be the president and uh, bring all the elders and have the council fire all the demons and bring in all the indigenous elders. And then we'll have a sane society and a sane world which will respect plants and nature and the need for oxygen and water. Pretty fundamental things, you know. Um, so yeah, just wanted to share a couple plants with y'all and uh, I'll bounce back on soon. Many blessings, peace, much love. God bless everybody. Thanks also for the ghost pipe purchases. I had a friend, you know, ask, uh, you know, well, is it proper to sort of educate people on things like ghost pipe? And some people think no harvesting of ghost pipe and no promoting the harvesting of ghost pipe because then people will go out and exploit it. Um, but, you know, I guess my take is like, well, people are already going out there and exploiting it. And the question is, do we try to teach an ethical caretaking method to the people who are already exploiting it? Or do we try to hide it and then people find it in other ways? And I think this usually backfires if we think about, you know, sex education, if we think about drug education, I think we always have the, the backfire problem where if we don't address it, if we don't talk about it, if we don't try for proper education, then people figure things out on themselves and it's not always the same as a context of elders who would help us and guide us through those rites of passage. And so hopefully what uh, is coming across is no, I don't condone and recommend going out and exploiting ghost pipe. Uh, hopefully that's not, it's obvious that that's not what I did. 
um, and I hope that it's coming across that, you know, I'm not saying that we should plant invasive plants all over the place and cut trees down and, uh, you know, sell it as firewood or whatever, uh, but figure out how we can interact with ecology in a way that's sustainable. So uh, with a ghost pipe too, so if I pick two pipes from a cluster of five or six, does that actually help the plant in some way or does it harm the plant? And that's a question that I've been contemplating a lot as far as plants almost rely on us to pinch parts of them back so that they can mutate and morph. And every single time we pinch a plant back or a deer or a rabbit or whatever nibbles on it, it changes the expression of the genetics forever. And it also puts DNA inside of the body of the plant to analyze. And I think that plants are analyzing all of the DNA, whether it's the saliva for the animal, the bacteria, the microbes you have under your fingernails when you pinch the plant back, um, all of those things are creating uh, immune responses in the plants. So when you harvest, when I harvested two pipes from each cluster like that, and I went for probably three weeks collecting ghost pipe from about six different spots, and I literally took less than 2% of what was growing there. And does that method actually cause further rooting, further root growth, further sensitivity to its need to survive and grow and proliferate? Uh, can that increase seeds, right? Can that uh, increase other aspects of the plant? So that's something that I would love to keep talking to you all about and contemplating together. And if you saw my video in the garden where I was pinching back the Tulsi tops, you know, that kind of harvest, like I noticed with calendula, we planted calendula and it was just about to start flowering and they were very spindly plants. They were root bound and we got it in the ground and I started pinching back every single flower that came out and drying it and then it would produce more flowers and I pinched it back and it would produce more flowers and proliferate and the plant got bigger and bigger and bigger and they got huge. They got full of flowers because of that kind of method, which is sometimes called deadheading. And they do that in horticulture to actually stop a plant from flowering to make the flowers bigger. Um, so that's like with marigolds and stuff. But there's also harvesting techniques in that kind of methodology and it does something chemically and physiologically to the plant. And I think sometimes we don't necessarily observe and uh, educate ourselves about how touching a plant or breaking parts of the plant off sends all kinds of signals to the plant to do something. And the question is, what is it? send it to do. When you do that, what do you sense that the plant is signaled to do within its own body, within its own immune system, within its own chemistry? Um, so a thing I've been thinking a lot about is how the bacteria under your fingernails, when you pinch that plant back, the plant is reading you. The plant is reading your DNA. You're putting DNA inside the body of the plant. You know, so we've been doing that for millions of years. So the plant's I feel almost expect for us to harvest and seed them. They've been in a relationship for so long with us that they rely on us, especially those cultivated herbs, right? But native people did this with all of the wild. I mean, if you go out and you forage blueberries and you eat blueberries, you don't chew all the seeds. And if you poop in the woods, you're farming blueberries, you know? And that was the way that the blueberries got proliferated for a long, long time. And so the question is, how do we find that in our modern cultural context now? There is, there's got to be a way to interact with the ecosystem to be regenerative versus exploitive. And that's kind of the question and the shift. And hopefully that comes across with the ghost pipe, um, you know, harvesting and sharing. It's like a very small batch. You know, someone else mentioned um, with ghost pipe, right? Well, what about CBD oil? They mentioned how ghost pipe can be replaced by other things like CBD oil. And, and my thoughts to that is, first of all, um, CBD oil is not necessarily as effective as ghost pipe. Ghost pipe is miraculous. It's amazing. I don't think it's a replacement. Um, I think, if anything, ghost pipe is a replacement for opiates, you know? And I don't think CBD is necessarily a replacement for opiates. Um, it can help, right? It mitigates pain, um, but it doesn't instantly make pain go away for all people. Um, probably neither does ghost pipe nothing does but it's also a monoculture and it's also industrial and so hemp growing in monocultures of fields takes thousands and thousands and thousands of acres away from habitat wild habitat right which could be proliferated 
and we could get grants for restoration for food and medicine uh, if we could identify and understand what was there. If everybody walked out of their front yard and knew there was food and medicine everywhere, then that would actually inspire them to care about when it's being turned into blacktop or concrete. And so the question is then, is CBD more regenerative than small batches of uh, ghost pipe, for example? You know, and there's, there's pros and cons on each side a monoculture of hemp, and then, you know, the CBD that we're getting is so refined. So how many plants go into your little dab of CBD? That's something we're not even thinking about yet. So I believe that CBD is putting the medicine in the hands of the corporate elite. It's going to be a large-scale industrial monoculture. We're back to square one in a lot of ways. And so cannabis as a whole is very different than just CBD extracted. Whenever you have an extract, you have largely, likely a monoculture, and monocultures are not necessarily um, forest restoration projects by any way, shape, or form. And what we need is forest because forest is our lungs and will die without air and oxygen, right? And so that's something, how do we balance the way we use land and how do we instill caretaker practices to land management in a way that's not exploitive and is regenerative. So feel free to share any of your thoughts on any of this. Sending you all lots of love. Thanks for listening. God bless you. Peace.